Welcome to Ghost Stories. I'm Ben Negron, and I'm here with Joe Frank. And Joe, what we want to know, are ghosts real? They are. They are? They are. Well. I mean, it's, it's a, a matter of opinion, but in my opinion, they are. I've dealt with them for almost 37 years of my life. And you worked with the, the Warrens, correct? Yep, yep. I was I've 18 had, when I met the, met the Warrens. I've had a burning question. And it, it kind of stems from the movies, mm. but I do want to know if Lorraine really had the gift. Yes. Really? She was. <coughs> she had the gift. She was a uh, clairvoyant. She could read your aura. If you if you ever heard the term aura, okay, it's that supernatural glow that emanates, you know, from everyone. And uh, she she definitely had the gift. She found out she had the gift when she was, oh, probably uh, your age, early teens, mid teens, when she went to Laurelton Hall in Milford, Connecticut. And she used to see these. She didn't know what it was at the time, mm -hmm. but she would see things around the nuns, you know, that, that were there teaching, and and uh, they used to um, they used to get mad at her because she would tell them things that no one else knew. But yes, she was very gifted. Lorraine Warren was very gifted. Were you ever with her at any time when she kind of just stopped, and it really got like whole room got quiet, and she's blocked? Oh in. yeah. I was up at, uh, one thing that comes to mind, a case in uh, Colby Sawyer College up in New Hampshire. My, uh, my wife, who I think she was just my girlfriend at the time, we weren't married, but this is back in 91, maybe, 1991. And Colby Sawyer College was um, alleged to be haunted by the spirit of uh, Mr. William Colby. Um, you know, nothing bad. It wasn't anything demonic or anything like that, but there were a few spirits there. And... What we did was, there was some college students there, where there were some people from the college newspaper, and we had, um, we all sat around in this big room, like living room, and the rain was talking to one of the servants, spirits, that was just going about her everyday job. And the rain, through her mind's eye, was communicating with it, and I was asking questions, much like you are, and the rain was getting the answers from the spirit. It was really interesting. And uh, th that's how, you know, we would work with her. She would see these things and talk to them. And uh, she's like, dear, you're dead. And no, no one's like, what are you talking about? I'm taking care of Master Colby. So she was still alive doing her job. And I don't know, it was 18-something. And you could smell this lavender scent. It was her perfume, according to what Lorraine said. We smelled this lavender. And lavender was one of Lorraine's favorite fragrances. But... Yeah, ghosts, ghosts are very real, and they're not all bad. <laughs> you know, TV wants you to believe that because it wants to scare you, that scare factor, because it turns into uh, money, big bucks. You know, these TV movies and, and Hollywood movies, theatrical movies that you see, um, that's what puts butts in the seats, right? You guys all like yes, scary, thrilling movies, things like that. But um, that's actually very rare. Stuff like that, it, it's rare. But this was a, kind of a, a cool, what we call earthbound spirit. It was a cool story. Okay. And I think we took like four or five pages of notes, you know, writing down what Lorraine was saying, the questions and the answers. But the answers were coming from the spirit world. So wow. it was really, really interesting. So you, you started working with them when you were 18, you said? I was 18 years old. I'll tell you the story. Because um, I, I remember it like it was five minutes ago. It was at the... Um, Holiday Inn in North Haven off exit 12. Okay. I think it's Ramada now. I'm not sure what it is. It's still there, next to Arby's. Yeah. Well, Laurel, my wife, had seen in the local newspaper that they were doing a lecture. And it was on a Friday night. And she's like, would you like to go? I'm like, yeah, well, why not? We were just dating at the time. I was 18. Uh, so we went there, and the rain looked at me when she first saw me. And she was looking at me strange. You know, and she kind of turned her head to the side. And she's like, honey, have we met before? And I, and I said, no, Lorraine, I've heard a lot about you. I've seen you guys on television and read about you in print media, the radio, things like that. And she's looking at me. Now, I didn't know what she was doing at the time, but she was reading my aura. And she's like, there's a reason you're here tonight. She was, make sure you come and see Ed and I after the show. So I was really excited. Yeah. Here I'm like, well, what do they want to talk to me about? You know, this is interesting. Couldn't keep a thought in my head. So, you know, they did their program, which was very fascinating. And, um, you know, Lorraine was talking to the crowd, everybody was kind of breaking up and leaving there, all coming up for autographs and things. And Ed's packing up, and Ed's like, come on, he was, come on, kids, let's go, I'm hungry. You know, so the diner across the street, the Athenian diner or something, um, we went over there. Lorraine was sitting across from me, and she was holding my hand, and she's, 
she was telling me what she was doing. She was reading my aura, and she looks at me, and she says, Honey, you were meant to do this work. She was like, Would you like to come and work with Ed and I? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, p picture that. Uh, you know, you had Ed and Lorraine Warren asking you if you'd like to be one of their students. And I said, absolutely. So, um, you know, from there, they used to give their classes in um, the back room of a place in Newtown called Holly Manor. The building's still there, but I think it's the inn at Newtown now. But there was a room, and we'd go in the back room there, and there'd maybe be eight or ten chairs set up for people. And uh, I think there was only like six of us there. It was Laurel and I and maybe four or five other people, um, students. And as far as I know, the students that were in that room, I'm the only one left. I don't know. Where, I haven't kept in touch with any, any of the other ones. But the year was 1986. You guys weren't born yet. I don't think. So, uh, so what Ed would do is he would bring in his case files, his notes, um, his tape recorder. And he would play for us the interviews and the tapes and show us videotapes from the cases that they worked on, okay. such as The Conjuring House, Amityville. Amityville was the one that freaked me out the most. All right, again, I'm 18 years old. I was a big kid, big guy. I was like 265 when I was in high school, you know. It doesn't matter how big and strong you are. Yeah. You need to be strong psychologically, emotionally, you know. Uh, you know, physical strength has, has not much to do with it spiritually. You really need to be, be strong. And people ask me all the time, well, weren't you scared? And I go, then, yeah, I was scared. I'm just a guy. I'm just a regular guy with an irregular hobby, you know. Um, but anyway, he would play these tapes and then he'd abruptly shut them off and say, okay, kid, that, that's enough. He goes, I don't want to give these things too much recognition. What he was playing in addition to the interviews by the people that lived there and telling their story, he was playing demonic voices that would come out of thin air. We would hear growling noises. I've got some on tape I'm going to show Saturday when we do the, sh the show at Lyman Hall Saturday. And, um, you know, I'm sitting there all here standing up on my whole body. You know, we've got goosebumps everywhere. And uh, that would be the class and then it'd say this is what happened this is what we did about it we had to bring in you know this this one we had to have this place exercise this person exercise and then my my first uh actual field trip for lack of a better term was when they took us out to take psychic photographs okay and it was it was a, it was i think it was a saturday it was bright sunlight you know maybe 11 12 o'clock in the afternoon in the morning and he's like, bring your camera. He goes, bring a roll of film. This is before digital, you know. Uh, you ever heard of something called Polaroid? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry, because it goes way back. We had Polaroid camera and then a th 35 millimeter camera. And I was nervous. I was excited, but I was nervous. I didn't know what to expect. You know, tramping through a cemetery taking photographs. Just random photographs, shots of headstones. He said, a lot of times if you look at these old headstones, you know, like even Center Street Cemetery here, you know, if you go during the day, you know, don't go after dark illegally, go in there during the day and be respectful, obviously. And you can take photographs of some of the old headstones. There's headstones in there from 1600s, I think. And uh, the oxidation on the stones, sometimes you can make out faces. You may not see them with the naked eye, but after you take your, your pictures, you may see them in the pictures. So this is why we were there. Okay. So, you know, I must have been taking pictures for 15 minutes or so. And Ed looks at me and goes, Joe, you got to take the lens cap off. <laughs> I was so nervous that I had, I had bought a brand new camera too. I remember it was a Vivitar camera I had bought uh, just for the occasion. And I was so nervous I forgot to take the lens cap off. So the first half of my pictures were just black and there was nothing there. You know. Um, so that's how I started out taking what they call spirit photography. You know, psychic photographs. And uh, you know, just to break you in, I didn't actually go on my first case for a number of years because he wanted to make sure I was ready. Was your was your first? You said you specialize in like demonology. Yeah, right. Right now, you know, I mean, I'll help anyone. We help people all, all over the world, and we don't charge for what we do. Not a penny. So, what is the story you know? of your first demon case? Well, the first the first case that involved a very negative entity, negative energy, um, was in Bristol, Connecticut, and I was probably about your age, maybe 21, 22. 
I remember we were at a lecture at it used to be the Ramada in in Meriden. It's still there. I don't know what it's called now. It's um, uh, it's in Meriden there, and uh, Ed gets a phone call during the lecture, and it's from a family that lived in Bristol. And this family was later on when I got there. I'll tell you, we were terrified. And Ed was like, "Okay, I'm going to have somebody come over there." So he calls me aside. He goes, "Take uh, Brian. I think his name was. I haven't seen him in 30 years." He goes, take Brian with you and go over to this house. He goes, take your equipment, take photographs, get your tape recorders out, just let them run, see what you get. He goes. Meanwhile, he was playing with Archbishop McKenna to have the home blessed. Okay. And the family, the family was being oppressed. They weren't possessed. You know, possession is when something takes over your body. They were, they were having a lot of poltergeist activity, dark shadows, foul smells. Uh, growling noises is you know scratching noises knocking on the wall mm -hmm. things like that scared the bejesus out of him so I get there and it, mind you this is the first case that I've actually gone in by myself without the warrants I was there under their direction so I knock on the door and the family opens the door you know I remember they open the door and I'm like yeah I'm Joe Frankie I'm here and Lorraine Warren sent me the door flies open and they grab me and they pull me <laughs> And the whole family, like, collectively gives me this big hug. And like, oh, my God, thank God you're here. And, and, and I'm like, I, I, I didn't know what to expect. It didn't tell me anything. And maybe he didn't know at the time. But I'm looking around. I come in the front door. To my right is uh, the open kitchen with the dining room table. To the left was the living room. I remember, remember it very vividly. And then there's a hallway. And down the hallway is a bathroom and a couple bedrooms. And I look over to my left in the living room, and everything this family owned, clothing, toys, bedding, mattresses, everything was in that living room. Basically what the family did is they were so afraid to live in their own home, which is a big pet peeve of mine. I'll get to that. Everything that these people owned, the clothing, everything, was in that room. They stuck together. They were so frightened that they wouldn't even go to the bathroom wouldn't go to the bathroom by themselves. What they used to do is they'd leave the bathroom door ajar, and if someone go in and use the, do their business, you know, and they would have their hand outside, and someone outside in the hallway would be standing there holding their hand. All right? Wow. It, this is how t terrified they were. They were afraid to even go into the bathroom by themselves because they claimed that they would see uh, images in the mirror. You know, they had like a... An old, I think one of them said they had an old man staring back at him, this ugly, grotesque-looking thing. And I said, well, tell me what's going on. What prompted the phone call that tonight? They said, the family was in the living room slash dining room area because it was a big open, it was a condo. Okay. And down the hallway, there's a bedroom at the end of the hallway which seemed to be the epicenter of the activity. They saw these two look like cloaked black figures. And they would come, uh, they were probably almost, almost as high as the ceiling. So your standard ceiling is about eight feet. So they were over seven feet tall, they said. And they, they didn't walk, they floated down the hallway towards them. And, you know, the family would, you know, somebody screamed and they said that then they would dissipate, they would disappear. But the entire family would see this, not just one person. And there was also a, a baby involved, and they had said a few days prior to that, they had the baby in the bassinet in the living room again. You know, the bedrooms were empty. There was nothing in the bedrooms. Everything was in the living room. And they said that they saw a, a, a same kind of figure, one of them this time, floated down the hall and went up to the bassinet and looked in, like, like it was bending over to look at the child. So this is the kind of stuff that would happen. They, you know, they, you, they'd hear growling at night. They'd hear banging on the walls at night, scratching noises. How long was this going on before? This, this was okay. going on, I mean, I don't think they were there that long. I don't, okay. I don't recall. We're going back to early 90s, probably, 89, 90, 91, in that, in that, in that time period. So this was on a, I think this was on a Friday or a Saturday, uh, probably a Friday night, because it was nighttime, we were at the lecture. And I spent the entire night there. Uh, I didn't sleep, but I, I told them, I said, look, I'm going to go in the back, because that's where they said these things came from. <laughs> I'm going back there. 
you know, I got to get evidence. It, it'll kill me. I got I to gotta get evidence. So I went back there with my video camera. I had a still, you know, my, another camera, 35 millimeter. I had my tape recorder. I turned everything on and just let them go. Nothing happened. Nothing happened. Okay. okay. My belief is it knew, I mean, these things have the wisdom of the ages. Okay. It knew why I was there. And it didn't want to mess with me. Not because it was afraid of me. It wanted to maintain its anonymity. It didn't want okay. to be discovered. These things want to hide in the shadows. And they prey on the weak. You know, I wasn't weak in the sense not physically strong, but spiritually. You need to be in a state of grace to go on these cases. Meaning you need to go to confession. Confess your sins. Be blessed by the priest. Have confession. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, communion. You know, you, you want to be, you know, your soul to be pure when you're going into any case because you don't know what you're going to deal with. It could be, you know, nothing. A lot of it, I think, is just psychosomatic. People watch too much TV. They watch too much of these TV shows. You know, have you ever seen the movie The Exorcist? Yes. Okay. You ever watched it by yourself at three in the morning? Okay. Probably not. Maybe you have. You know, The Exorcist, you know, um, you know, I'll get that in a minute. I don't want to bounce around. I digress a lot. I jump around. But I'll talk about the exorcist in a moment. So anyway, I set up shop in the back bedroom. The only thing that was on the floor, I think, was a couple of Legos. And yeah, I stepped on them. They hurt. You know, but uh, the, all the bedding, I said, all the bedding, everything, lamps. There wasn't anything in the room. Um, maybe just the cable wire. Uh, and then the closet. And they said they seemed to come emanate from the closet area. So I had the closet door open and I had my camera, video camera, trained on the closet the whole night. And I said to the family, um, I, had, I had somebody with me, I think it was Brian was his name. We, I said, we're going to camp out back here. I said, you go out in the living room and try to get some sleep because they, they weren't getting any sleep. Yeah. You know. So one of my biggest pet peeves is when someone has a home either a single family residence or an apartment or, or a condo, you're paying money, whether it be rent, lease, or, or, you know, a mortgage, on your home, and you're too afraid to live there. Or you're afraid to go into the basement to do the laundry. Or you're afraid to go, to, go into the attic, because you know everything happens in the basement and the attic, right? It, you know, I, I mean, I, I say that tongue-in-cheek, but, you know, people are afraid to live in their own home or be alone in their own home. You know, so we stayed the night. The family got a little rest. They got a few hours sleep because they knew at least we were there. Yeah. And, you know, we believed them, of course. I mean, you know, um, I can tell when someone's being untruthful with me. I mean, it's, it's just something that you uh, acquire that kind of gift, you know, when you've been doing this a long time. I do a lot of investigating before I even decide to take a case, you know, because I want to make sure that, um, you know, they're being truthful. And a lot of times people, it's not that, that they're being uh, purposely untru untru you know, untruthful. It's just that they really believe in their minds that this stuff is happening. Yeah. I've interviewed you know, families and uh, the husband say, I don't know, she's crazy. I don't see any of this stuff. And the wife's like, I don't know why you don't see it. It happens all the time. You know, you know one of the questions is, well, do you watch any of these TV shows? And they're like, well, yeah, we like to watch this one and that one. I don't do TV shows anymore. I did a few back in the 90s, and I was you know, on a couple of shows. The show Ghost Hunters was offered to us, my buddy and I, back in 2002. Uh, they sent us an email. They wanted us to fly to L.A. and do a couple of pilot episodes. Uh, where it would have went, I don't know, but we were, we were one of their first choices for that show, and I turned it down. I'm in this work to help people. It's a vocation. It was a calling. It's not an occupation. As I said, we don't charge to help people. You know, we may ask f for them to cover our expenses. You know, say, you know, if I'm if I'm flying somewhere, I got a case now I'm working on in San, San Antonio. It's pretty bad. I may have to go there. We ask the family if they have the means to cover our travel expenses. If they can't do it, I pay out of my pocket. I'm not going to say no. You know, and you know, so. Um, it, 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 we're here to help people. We're not here to you say, "Oh, you don't have the money to pay, you know, pay for us to come down there." We're not coming down there. I've never turned anybody away. 
you know, it, it's stressful, <laughs> financially stressful sometimes, but, you know, the reward that you get back is immeasurable. Just, you know, knowing, you know, the people that you've helped makes you do feel so much better about yourself. So, uh, I started to touch on uh, The Exorcist movie, and we talked about, I don't know if we were on, on camera at the time, but we were talking about Ouija boards. The Exorcist, the true story, it's based on a true story. It was a 13-year-old or 14-year-old boy named Robbie in 1949, okay, just a normal, normal kid like yourselves, you know, young man. And he started playing with the Ouija board with his aunt. Why? I don't know. It's one of the dumbest things you could do. Uh, it's a board game by Parker Brothers. It's not the game itself, the physical game. It's the intent behind it. So why would you buy a Ouija board? What's the, and especially if you buy it on second hand from a flea market or something, you don't know where that board's been or what it's been used for. And that's the word you were talking about. Um, doorway. Doorway, yes. We, using a Ouija board is a form of divination, and the Catholic Church preaches against divination. Okay? Things like the Ouija board, I mention that a lot because I've had a lot of Ouija board cases, and some of them didn't end well. Okay? Um... The board is used, well, what other intention could you be using it for but to contact someone from the other side? You know, and of course, the demonic is always out there because it hates us. Because we're made in God's image. Okay? We're all children of God. We're all brothers and sisters. You know, in my, in my belief, you know. Um, but the demonic hates us because it hates God. You know, so they're always out, out to destroy us. And, you know, they want to harm us. They want to destroy our families. They want to destroy our finances. They want to get us fired from our jobs. They want our marriages to crumble. And they sit there on the sidelines and they laugh. It's fun to them, okay? And the fear that we give off just fuels them. So, you know, that's why I said you have to be strong if you're going to battle these things spiritually, psychologically, emotionally. You know, the first time I was attacked, I was scared out of my mind. I was your age. Imagine getting picked up and thrown about 12 feet across the room and hitting the wall. I was terrified. I was shaking, but I got up, dusted myself off, and I'm like, is that all you got? You know, I said, I'm not leaving. No matter what, I said, you're the one that's leaving. You know? Well, most people, when I interview people for our organization, the Warren Legacy Foundation, you know, I'm a very tough interviewer because i got to make sure someone can handle that. No. If I pose the question to you guys, you're in a home and, you ha and you're and you trying to help a family and you don't know what's going on, you've never been there before, and then all of a sudden the crap hits the fan, things start happening, dishes start flying out of the, out of the cupboards, the you know doors are slamming, opening and closing on their own, windows are going up and down on their own. Yeah, you see that on TV, Hollywood, but it, it, it happens. You know, these things want to scare you. It's fun for them. It, they want to scare you. And, you know, um, so say, say this all starts happening. I mean, that's how it starts. You know, with outward signs of manifestation. I mean, most people would be out of there, right? You'd be running for the nearest door. Quick. Right? And I wouldn't blame you. I wouldn't blame you. So I remember asking this one woman. She was a really nice lady. She lived in Michigan or something. She was... And, you know, she, she wanted to be, be kind of our, part of our foundation. And I said, well, how long have you been doing this work? She said, probably about five years. I said, well, have you been doing the work for five years or you've just been fascinated in the occult and ghosts for five years? She said, there's a big difference. I said, have you had any formal education on it? Meaning, have you hooked up with a team that's experienced and been shown the way like I was? Not everybody, <laughs> it's very rare to be lucky like I was and been taught by the Warrens themselves. They were my mentors. I was their protege. But, and she's like, well, no, I've just been doing this on my own and with my girlfriend for about five years. I'm like, well, what have you been doing? Oh, you go to cemeteries and public, public places that are alleged to be haunted and things like that. And I said, okay. I, I said, you know, I, I'm not holding that against her, but it, these aren't the kind of people I'm looking for. I'm looking for people that are a little more experienced and are not going to go run screaming from the house like their hair is on fire. Because that's, that's, you know, 
that's leaving the family hanging, and it's embarrassing for themselves and for the foundation. So, you know, I asked her these questions. I said, I said, and then it gets worse. I said, and then you get picked up by some unseen force, and you get thrown across the room. I said, well, what do you think? Because I, I know it's never happened to you before, correct? I said, and, and she said, no. And her, she got deer in headlights. She's looking at me. This is through Zoom meeting. And I said, well, what do you think you would do? And she paused for a moment, and she said, well, I wouldn't run. Really? I said, I would have respected you more if you'd just been honest with me. And said, I'd probably, you know, crap yeah, my pants. Yeah. You know? So I said, okay, well, thank you. And then I had a few other questions for her, and um, I denied her application. Because he, here's why. If I let people like that in the foundation, and I have a case in her area, and this woman and her friends, you know, if they're accepted into the foundation, that you have to be foundation members, and they go in on a case, and something happens to them, I'm responsible for that. All right? I couldn't, I couldn't live with myself if something happened to them. I've got to make sure they're ready, they're prepared, you know. So um, I get very long-winded, guys. I'm sorry. Oh, you're good. Do you have any other questions? Um, I'm sure you guys got many. What's your most recent case you worked on? Well, I'm, I'm working cases all the time. I've got uh, probably about four or five active ones right now all over the country. Um, the recent one just had a call with the homeowner and her daughter are in, is in San Antonio. They've moved five times in 11 years. It follows them. It follows them. And it's, it's pretty bad. And some of the things that I won't, I won't say because it's, it's pretty bad. I, I don't want to say to you guys and scare you or anything but it's so that's in San Antonio and then there's one there's two cases in Michigan there's one in Ohio there's one in Sacramento that's pretty bad that may she may have a demonic attachment to her you ever see the movie The Exorcism of Emily Rose yes yeah. Annalise Michelle it's based on a true story the woman is has lost 50 pounds in about two months because the entity is not letting her eat or drink so it's affecting her medically. Is this like, is this a case for a lot of, the, is this the case for a lot of your cases? Like do demonic energies follow people? They can. Here? They can. Energies can attest themselves to people, objects. You know, that's why I do caution people that go antiquing. I'm not saying if you yeah. like to go antiquing, you're going to bring something home with you. I'm just saying, be cautious. I, I have a case in Rhode Island that's calmed down quite a bit now. But the gentleman collects uh, war artifacts, like bayonets and stuff like that, and swords. And he gets, he'll, he'll buy them like through eBay, yeah. stuff like that, from all over the world. I'm like, and then he's got some activity in his home, he said. The team went in there, they weren't part of our foundation, they got scared off by something, and the guys like Joe, they couldn't get out of here fast enough. They basically packed up their stuff and left. He goes, they won't return my phone calls, they won't call me. I don't know what they captured. They haven't shown me anything. So, fortunately, I was I was fortunate enough to get a hold of one of the members of that team who was the case manager. The title they give themselves, and she was a really nice uh, girl. I mean, she's a young girl, maybe 25, 24, 25. And I said, "Listen, young lady. I said, you know, I don't want to. I don't mean to pry. I said, but this family has now contacted the Warren Legacy Foundation, and I need to know what happened." I need to know what I'm getting into and what this family is dealing with. I said, would you be willing to share with me? She's like, Joe, I'm so glad you got a hold of me. I, I was trying to find somebody to tell, someone to get help for this family because they were weighing over their heads. Mm -hmm. this, is what, this is what I call thrill seekers. Mm -hmm. These groups, they go out there, and now that you're misrepresenting yourself, you're getting into somebody's home. A family contacts you, and they're frightened, much like this family in Bristol I was telling you about. But you don't know what you're doing. You know, you just, I just want to go out there and capture something on camera so I can throw it up on my social media pages, on YouTube, and get a bunch of likes and stuff like that. You can't do that because this is a per, per prime example because they knew they got in over their heads. They ran out of the house, basically, according to what the homeowner told me. And I said to the girl, I said, well, I hope your group took down their Facebook page took down their YouTube channel and, and sold their camera equipment. But no, 
they're still out there doing, you know, they're still doing doing this work. When they left a family hanging, and eventually they find their way to someone like me, you know, or some other. Uh, there, there are other people that do this work, good people. Um, but I, I got wind of it, and um, I'm working with the family now. Um, so I, at any given time, I've got a handful of cases going on. I am the CIO for the Warren Legacy Foundation. That's the chief investigative officer. The foundation has members worldwide. We have people uh, in you know in Spain, Portugal, Costa Rica, Australia, New Zealand, the UK, Germany, oh, and, and of course across the United States. My job is we have regional directors for these locations. So I have a regional director for like the South. Southeast, Florida, Georgia, stuff like that. Regional director for the Midwest, regional director for the Western portion of California. When they get a case where they need help, then they call me. Like if they need my input and I say, Joe, can you go on this Zoom call with the client? I'm like, yeah, all right. So my wife's not too happy with me because I'm on the phone every night. Thank God she works nights. Uh, I'm on the phone just about every night um, on a call. You know, sometimes they're not that bad. You know, sometimes I say, you know, look, Personally and professionally, I really don't think you have much to worry about. This is what I want you to do. Try this and then get back to us. Let, let us know how this works out. But these other couple of cases, the one in Sacramento and the one in San Antonio, and there's one in Michigan that's pretty bad. Demonic, I don't know yet. Okay. I'm not saying that there's a demon, but there's something very negative. It could be a negative human spirit. Because, hey, if you're a jerk in life, you're probably a jerk after you pass away. Okay. You know? Like again, remember I mentioned earlier about free will? Not every spirit goes on, it, whatever your belief system is. But, you know, some spirits remain earthbound for a variety of reasons. Maybe they feel they have unfinished business. Maybe they feel they're not going to be accepted on the other side because they were jerks in life, you know. And maybe they just get their jollies off of haunting people, you know. So they're not all demonic, they're which is rare. Enough. They're just negative jerks. You know, and they want to mess with people. Now, could you tell us what the other team saw when they went in there? Well, one of the things she did tell me, and she said she was there, was that there was a can of caviar on the counter in the kitchen, and nobody was near it, and the thing exploded. And they said they heard growling and they heard scratching. That's what I was told. Okay. I asked for evidence of that. I said, did you capture it on film? And she said, I think the guy that runs the organization, the group, and I'm not going to mention the group's name. I wouldn't do that publicly. Um, and she's like, she goes, I don't have access to it. So you never got it? I said, well, well, I said, if your true intention was to help this family, then you're going to tell me anything I want to know because now it's in my lap and I'm trying to help. She was extremely helpful. She goes, Joe, I'll tell you whatever you want, but she goes, I wasn't the only one there. I don't know everything that happened. And, and they hadn't even had a team meeting afterwards. I would have a team meeting and say, all right, everybody, let's get together, get all your evidence together, let's see what we have. They have and, and, and we're talking like, this happened in April, and I got the case in July. It was like three months. And the guys, like, these, they just ghosted them. No pun intended, but, you know, it's a word that we use today, right? They, they just ghosted the guy, and they, they wouldn't call him back. They wouldn't give him any information. So, but this, this young lady was very helpful, um, but she said that one thing that did happen, physi physical manifestation, was this can of caviar, and I asked her, was the can open? And they said, no. The homeowner said, no. It was just sitting on the counter, and it exploded. The cap went flying. Actually, the cap, the can cap, landed in one of their, one of their equipment bags, you know. So, I'm like, okay, that's not... You know, normally what happens to a can of caviar. <laughs> I, but, you know, it didn't alarm me. Um, I said, okay, I always tell people, let's, let's try and look scientifically at this. Is there a natural explanation for what just happened? Okay, don't jump to the supernatural right away. Let's think about this logically. You know, why, why did this happen? And that comes from, I got that from Ed Warren, because he grew up in a haunted house. And he, he told me, as a young kid, he would see these spirits in his room like come out of his closet and his father was a state trooper in Connecticut and his father would say son there's a reason why everything happens there's a reason why that happened or whatever just kind of poo-pooed it 
So I'm like, all right, well, if if you do an exhaustive investigation into the, if if something could happen naturally and, and you can't come up with anything, maybe it's time to look at something supernatural. You know, I, I'm, I'm like, well, did something hit this can? Did it fall? And they're like, no, it was just sitting on the counter. I wasn't there. Yeah. I said, well, did anybody have any cameras rolling? I guess they didn't. Did, you could hear what they told me was the can exploding mm. on, a, on an audio tape that, from a recorder that was in another room. And I'm like, look, okay, I'm not, I'm not saying you're making this up, but <laughs> my old adage is if, if there's no evidence, if it's not documented, it didn't happen. Yeah. Because, you know, all right, I'm, I'm believing you, you know, that this happened. All right, all right, well, did anything else happen? Well, you know, we saw these orbs on the ring camera. I'm like, I'm not even, I'm yeah. discounting that. Because yeah. yeah, they, they sent me some of the ring camera footage. Mm. One of them, the guy was freaking out about, it was a spider web. <laughs> it literally was a spider web. And it was blowing in the breeze. And from the light, uh, the porch light, it was illuminating it. And I'm like, that's a spider web. Or it's a cobweb. I said, it's nothing to worry about. The orbs could be dust, bugs, water vapor. I, I can usually tell if it's some kind of energy because, you know, dust kind of floats. It doesn't have a trajectory. You know, I've seen orbs that will come, stop, re reverse direction. Maybe it's a bug. I don't know. You know, we've done tests and, and studies on this stuff, but orbs don't impress me. You know, but I said, listen, in my personal and professional opinion, as I'm telling you right now, I don't think you have any issues to worry about. I said, but I will tell you this. Start a journal. Go back as far as you can remember and, and just write down. It doesn't have to write a novel. Just the, the what, when, who. You know, what happened, when it happened, who was present, who witnessed it. Okay, write everything down because you're going to forget. Yeah. You know, if you're like me, you're going to forget. You know, write it down, just bullet point it, keep a journal moving forward. I last talked to him a couple months ago. I said, I want to know, here's my personal phone number, call or text me. I don't care if it's 3 in the morning, I may not hear the phone, but I know if you're calling me at 3 in the morning that you're pretty scared. I haven't heard anything, knock on wood. So no news is good news. Hopefully, so um, that seems that case seems to be okay. I can't explain the caviar thing, no. but I haven't seen the video of it. The girl thinks that they caught it on video, but she didn't have it. And it's really hard to get other teams to get to, to work together and share information. And that's why I said what I said to her. I said, if you really wanted to help these people, then you would help me because yeah. I'm trying to help them now. You know, people get standoffish, and they'll say, well, this is our case. I said, look, it's not your case. You failed, and you failed miserably. I said, I don't care about the case. I'm trying to help these people. You know, they're frightened. The guy, the, the guy who was 39 years old, the son, because the father, who was in his 60s, uh, is the one that contacted us. The son told me, his dad and him were on a Zoom meeting. He told me that he locks himself in his bedroom at night because it makes him feel safe o okay and he doesn't come out until the morning 39 years old now the grown man i said well let me just tell you this it, it, there's nothing demonic there i can i can tell you that right now i, I would feel it as if there was something demonic there a locked door is not going to save you i said it, you know i said i don't think you have anything to worry about and i was on the phone for a couple hours and I'm hoping I could see some relief in their faces and the fact that I haven't heard from them in a while tells me that things might have quieted down or maybe some of it was up here. And again, I'm not accusing them of making it up. People that experience phenomena, in their mind, it's real. It happened. Okay? But maybe something happened, but it wasn't to the degree that you're making it. You're making a mountain out of a molehill, so to speak. You know? It's my job to comfort them, to listen to them, to say... You know, you're not crazy, you know? Because people, like, oh, I was afraid to tell anybody they think I'm crazy. I'm like, well, you, you know, I'm not going to think that because I, there is, ghosts are very real. Spirits, demonic forces are very real. I'm saying that because I've been doing this for almost 37 years of my life, and I haven't been wasting that much time. My entire adult life I've been doing this work. I've seen <laughs> things I could tell you, but that would take a lot more time than we have. But you'll tell them on November 5th? 
Yes, All so right. on no okay, so November fifth, this coming Saturday at Lyman Hoss High School from one to three PM, uh, the adult educa only for the adult education department is sponsoring a lecture. My my buddy and I who uh, I also founded the Connecticut Paranormal Research Society with my good friend Orlando Ferranti, we're gonna be presenting some real evidence of what I've been talking about all night here. So tell your friends and your family. Um, if you want tickets or reservations, just contact the um, Adult Education Department. I have nothing to do with that. Okay. Well, we're trying to get, you know, I'd like to fill the gymnasium, or the auditorium, rather, that would be great. with people, you know. And my job is not to sit and tell stories, although I love to talk, if you haven't figured that out by now. My job is to educate. Because when I do lectures, a lot of people in the audience are paranormal researchers. or They, tr <coughs> they say they are. And, like, if you're out there in the audience, you don't have to raise your hand. I'm not picking on you. I'm not trying to, in, you know, insult anyone. But I'm telling you, don't misrepresent yourself. If you don't know something, ask someone that does. Ask for help. Call me. Here's my card. Here's my home number. Here's my home email. So, yeah, so this Saturday, November 5th, uh, at Lyman Hall High School, um, spread the word if you can. I, I thought it was already out into the, in the high schools, but... Trying to get the, the, uh, uh, this out to the community, you know, a lot of people um, love this subject, not just when it's Halloween, I lecture year-round, but it is Halloween, everybody's thinking about ghosts and goblins, and, and it's fun. It's going to be a fun event, it's not going to be all negative, demonic, but I am going to talk about Annabelle, I'm going to talk about uh, the Amityville case, which wasn't the Amityville horror at the time, it was just another case that the Warrens were called in on. The book and the movie turned it into the end of a horror, but I tell you, what that family went through, no one should have to go through. It was pretty bad. Pretty bad. So I'm going to tell you what I know about that story. People are like, oh, Joe, you were at Amityville? I'm like, no, I was six <laughs> <laughs> or eight in 1976 when this happened. I said, I was eight years old. Um, so I wasn't there, but, you know, uh, the people that were um, told me what happened. Um, so I'm gonna, and I'm going to show you some evidence from our cases, some of our cases that we've worked on. I've got an entity that's seen coming out of a baby's crib, and it's pretty compelling evidence. You know, um, so you know, might have some uh, visitor. Hannibal might show up. You never know. So yeah, I hope I hope to get a lot of people out there. Um, so tell your friends, uh, your family. You know. Bring some popcorn, whatever. It's going to be a lot of fun, you know. And I'll take questions, you know. If people have questions, hopefully there'll be enough time. They'll give me the shepherd's hook, <laughs> you know. Because uh, I, I tell you, once I get started, that's why people said, Joe, I'm just going to introduce you and turn off the microphone and just let you tell stories, you know. It's a good time. How much time do we have? Does anybody else have any questions? Ladies, anybody? question yeah how do you get rid of the entities at the houses well that depends depends on the entity it, it there's a lot of factors involved but um i do what we call spirit rescue if it's if it's a, if it's a lost spirit that needs help passing over we, we do that through various forms you know sometimes it's just as easy as walking around and say go on into the light mm -hmm. you know um you know or, or pray for one of their family or lo members or loved ones that have passed to pull them over to guide them over uh, if it's a negative entity that I deal with, that it gets a lot harder or more involved because they don't want to go, you know. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't worry about that, you know. You, you know, I wouldn't worry about it. I don't think any of you guys have any issues there. That's, I always want to say that because I want people to go home and say, am I going to have a ghost follow me home because I went to one of these lectures? <laughs> no, just don't play with these things that I mentioned. You know, it's not, it's not safe to do that. Do you think you've ever had anything follow you? Oh, yeah. Days. Oh, all the time. Just being on a Zoom call the other night, I had something in my house. Yeah. Just, it doesn't stay there, but I can feel it. Yeah. And, I, you know, I get so tired sometimes, like, oh, I'm not in the mood. Get yeah. the blank out of here. <laughs> or I'm going to make you do the dishes. You know, yeah, but you, it's a good question. Yeah. Things follow me because they're curious. They want to know about me. They want to know, you know. I'm like, well, you know, if it's demonic, it'll already know who I am. And it hates me. You know, the Ed had an old saying, he goes, the devil knows who we are and he, he doesn't like us because you're there to try and defeat him. But it's not me, the man, defeating him. It's my faith and, you know, I got, I got big friends upstairs that help me out. Yeah. Any more questions? No? Well, you guys are awfully quiet. 
I'm really interested in what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad it wasn't boring. But uh, <laughs> I could probably bore people too. But yeah. Well, if, if you're if you're on Saturday, come on down. Bring your parents, siblings, friends. Well, thank you, Joe. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Ghost stories.